Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our coming together. We thank you for the influence and the power and the impact of your word. We thank you for the promises you have given us as well. Thank you for the privilege of praying. We are praying, O oh Lord, as you open our eyes to see your truth once again today. The power to really pray. And the faith to have the prayers answered. You give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that you challenge us to go beyond the normal average realm of the average believer so that we'll be able to do exploits for the Lord in Jesus' name. Bless your people, Lord, and use us to bless other people. In Jesus' name we pray. In James chapter 5, verse 16 through to verse 18, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and he trained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. We've been talking about the power of praying and fasting. And uh, we posed quite a lot of questions. Yet, we need to realize that the privilege of praying and the power of fasting are revealed in the Word of God. And yet, there are many, many things that the present-day believers have missed out. When we think of the people that prayed, and the people that had power with heaven, we think about people like Abraham, people like Moses, people like Elijah, people like Joshua, people like Daniel, people like Peter, James, John, Paul, and our Lord Jesus Christ. But as you look at the prayer lives of these people, there is something that strikes you very definitely. And it is that they didn't just pray for themselves. They prayed for communities around them. And it will be wonderful if the believer can lift up his eyes and look beyond himself. Because we are very weak when we think about ourselves only. And then you think of uh, what believers are praying for today. We generally pray for material things. Or we pray for personal things. And many people are no more concerned with what it means to be justified by faith. What it means to be righteous. What it means to be holy. What it means to have power with God and to walk with God. And to be able to see the Lord on the final day. In verse 16 it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Pray one for another. He wants us to think about other people, the needs of other people, and going beyond other people in our neighborhood to the whole nation. Then he tells us in verse 16, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You find that many people today that pray fervently, they do not think about righteousness. They do not think about holiness at all. They just read this as saying the effectual fervent prayer of a religious man. They may be religious, they may talk about prayer, they may talk about fasting, but they do not talk anymore about the importance of being born again. And if there is anything we ought to emphasize today, it is what we need to emphasize every time. It is a new birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
The very first thing you should check up in your life is, are you born again? Are you living a transformed life, a changed life? Are you still righteous in the Lord? If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Is that still important to you today? Blessed are they that thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are we hungry for righteousness today? Are we thirsty for righteousness today? Do we want righteousness at all costs? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are we panting after that holiness of God? Do we want that experience of purity of heart? Is that still important to us? When we talk about praying and fasting, and we talk about having power with God, you are talking about the people that still take the new birth very seriously. And the people that still hold on to holiness of life, purity of heart, and they hold on to that very seriously too. Then he talks about Elias, Elijah. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. He wanted revival for the nation. He wanted the nation to be turned back unto the Lord. And he knew that if he prayed and there was no rain, the farming, the drought, the need will make the people to want to look for God and to search for God and to seek Him. Because of that, he prayed that it might not rain. What's the motivation for our prayer today? Is it that people will turn to the Lord? Is it that people will call upon the Lord? Why are we praying and fasting? What is it we are looking for? Is it so that righteousness will reign? Is it that people will seek the Lord and there will be a mighty revival of repentance and righteousness and holiness? And then we are told, and he prayed again. That the, and the heaven gave rain. Why did he pray again? Why did he say that the Lord should not bring the rain? He said, turn these people to yourself, that they might know that you are God. It's so that they will know the true God. Is that the reason for our prayer today? Or is it all personal? It's an individual thing. I want it for myself. I want it for my family. When you look at the people in Bible days that prayed, you'll find that they were concerned for people to know the Lord. They were concerned for there to be righteousness, holiness in the community, in the nation. Actually, when you study the Bible seriously, you'll find that believers in Bible days, they sought for the glory of God and they sought the Lord. Those people too, they knew the importance of praying and fasting. Almost all the believers in the world accept and practice some form of praying. But many, many people do not have results for their praying. Why? Because they have their priorities misplaced. They don't know what to pray for. They don't put spiritual things first. They do not seek for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. They are not concentrating on things of eternal value. They are not concentrating on things that the Bible counts important. That although they know that it's important to pray, the things they are praying for are almost worthless and useless in the sight of God. Because of that, many prayers are not answered. But then, when we talk about prayer, we're even saying that many people know about prayer. But very few believers have balanced biblical understanding about fasting. That's why it's important for us to think and to look at what the Bible has to say concerning praying and fasting. That's why I still want to look at this important subject, the power of prayer and fasting. There will be three points we are going to consider. Number one, unknown privilege of fasting. Unknown Untold, unrealized privilege of fasting. There are many, many things the Bible says about fasting. And I wish I could have the time to show you from the Bible what the Bible says about praying and fasting. And the place where the Bible puts praying and fasting. But I want you to see in every case of the one of the scriptures I'm going to read to you that these things go beyond 
personal, selfish, private kind of need and request. In First Samuel chapter 7. First Samuel chapter 7, reading from verse 4. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to me, Spain, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to me, Spain, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. I want you to understand that this was a national event. There was a national problem. The nation had gone away from the Lord. As a result of that, they were facing trouble. They were facing affliction from the enemies. Do you know what they did? They started with repentance. They started putting things right in their lives. You are going to pray and you are going to fast. You check up your life first. You purge your life first. You get rid of things in your life that may be a disturbance, a hindrance to your prayer. The children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. That's the where way to serve. If you want that prayer and fasting to have power, and if you want it to really bring results in your family, in your community, in the church, as well as in the nation. There must be thorough repentance. And in verse 5 it says, Samuel said, Gather all Israel to me, pay, I will pray for you unto the Lord. They gathered together, verse 6, And they drew water, and they poured it out before the Lord. They were saying, O oh Lord, we consecrate our lives. Our lives have been wasted already. In pouring out water, they were saying our lives are like wasted water. It's been poured out. We cannot gather it back again except if the Lord will work a miracle. And then they fasted on that day. And then they said, we have sinned against the Lord. They confessed. They repented. They turned away from evil in the cause of fasting before the Lord. And the Philistines heard that the children of Israel gathered together to meet Spain. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the children of Israel had it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And then they made a sacrifice. Now look at verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. You will see that there was repentance. They turned unto the Lord. Because they fully turned unto the Lord and also asked that they should be prayed for. They were prayed for and the Lord answered. If we're going to see real power manifested in times of praying and fasting, one, the prayer should not be selfish. It should not be limited to just my personal need. And even if I'm going to talk about myself, it should not be limited to physical need. If the Lord sees that you are not serious about righteousness, you are not serious about holiness, you are not thinking of things of eternal value, you are not thinking about heaven, you are only thinking of your present need, physical need, the Lord is not likely to take you very serious. In Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. From verse 1. And it came to pass after this also, that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon with them of the others uh, beside the Ammonites came against Josephat to battle. And then there came some that told Josephat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side, Syria. And behold, they be in Azazontaman, which is Engedi. 
And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. Can you see here, it was a national problem again, against Judah. And then Jehoshaphat was concerned. He wasn't just concerned about himself, he was concerned for Judah, the people of God. Can you see here, although he proclaimed the fast, it was to solve a problem not limited to himself alone. When you are sick, you stop thinking about yourself alone. And when you become sanctified, you totally stop just thinking about yourself. You think about other people, those who are not saved. You think about the nation, those who do not know their left from their right. You think about other people who are perishing. If they died, they will go to hell. Because of that, you are concerned. Here, Jehoshaphat was concerned. And then he set himself to seek the Lord. Not just to seek solution to this present problem. First of all, he knew that the Lord was greater than the solution to his problem. Therefore, he was going to seek the Lord. There are many people that are seeking a gift from the Lord. An answer to their prayer. They are not seeking the Lord for who he is. They want church. They want work. They want success. They want uh, prosperity. Or they want peace. Or they want a wife or they want husband, or they want whatever it is, but they do not count the Lord greater than all those things. Jehoshaphat said himself to seek the Lord. And then he proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together in verse 4 to ask help of the Lord. To ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. They honored the Lord, they loved the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. Eventually, the Spirit of God came upon someone there and told them they will not need to fight at all. In verse 17, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, be not dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord and worship, worshiping the Lord. You will see that they put the Lord in the right place. They gave him the center of the whole stage. And they exalted him in their lives. And then in verse 20, they rose early in the morning. And went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. The fasting was not enough. You must have faith in God. Believe in the Lord your God. The prayer is not enough. You must have faith in God. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. Take the words of the prophets. Take those words serious. The word of revelation from the Lord, and so shall ye prosper. And then he consulted and the people appointed singers unto the Lord. And that, that they should praise the beauty of holiness. Can you see the place they gave, uh, the central place, and uh, they gave holiness? To praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And then as you read on in the story, they overcame. They defeated the enemy. Why? Because they put the Lord in the right place. They gave him the first place. And then they put holiness, righteousness in the center of everything that they were doing. And you see that the Lord answered their prayers. And they didn't have to fast the second time, and the third time, and the fourth month, and the fifth month. Over that same problem, they depended upon the Lord, and the Lord answered their prayer. Let's look at Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. 
from verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. That's fasting. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Can you see here, the fasted is true. But the fasting was not in isolation. It's not just fasting, doing without food, doing without water, and continuing in sin. That's what you find many people doing today, many churchgoers, and many people who say they are going to spiritual churches. How do they do it? The fighting continues, the violence continues, the stealing continues, immorality continues, getting angry continues, hatred in their heart will continue, and yet they will say they are fasting. They are waiting upon the Lord, they are asking the Lord to do this for them, and do that for them. There is no change of life. There is no emphasis on salvation. There is no repentance at all. They are not seeking the Lord so that they can be righteous. All they are asking for, give me this and give me that. I will get everything from the Lord with prayer and fasting. It does not work that way. There must be repentance in your life. There must be righteousness in your life. Look at verse 10. When God saw their works, what works? The work of repentance. What work? The fruits of repentance. When God saw the change of attitude, when God saw that repentance in their lives, that they turned from their evil way. It's not just the fasting that you saw. You see, there are many people that just say, I will get whatever it is from the Lord by getting away from food. I'm going to get that thing out of the hand of the Lord. Check up your life. If there is evil there, if there is iniquity there, put that away. When God saw that they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. He did it not. If you are a real child of God, the Lord is expecting that you take care of the spiritual matters first. After you are taking care of the spiritual matters, then you will see how you'll pray unto the Lord, wait upon the Lord, and the Lord definitely will answer. Matthew chapter 17 now. You have seen all these uh, cases that we have uh, read about. In the case of uh, the children of Israel, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, they are backsliding. Therefore, they turned back unto the Lord. In the case of uh, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat, they had not really backslidden, but there was trouble. But it was uh, a kind of national trouble. They waited upon the Lord. They sought the Lord. They exalted the holiness and the righteousness of the Lord. They prayed and they fasted. And they said they were going to believe the Lord and believe His prophet. And then they sang unto the Lord. And the Lord gave them the answer. In the case of the Ninevites, they were sinners. And they fasted before the Lord, but understand that they repented of their sins. They put the evil in their hands away, and the Lord answered their prayer. Let's look at Matthew now, chapter 17, reading from verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy upon my son, for he is lunatic. And so vex, for oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. I brought him to thy disciples, that, and they could not cure him. And G then Jesus said, Jesus answered and said, O faceless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. 
and the child was cured from that very hour. Please let us understand once again. I've told you this before. This boy was not a believer. The father was not a believer. He came from outside the church. And then he came to the disciples. The disciples were not sanctified yet. They were not baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. But they were saved. They had been given some measure of authority. Therefore, they should have been able to deal with the case. But they had not been able to deal with the case. But the father will not give up. Therefore, the father waited until Jesus came. And he presented the boy, epileptic boy, before the Lord. And then Jesus rebuked the devil. Please understand, he didn't use any formula. He didn't have to do it three hours. He didn't have to do it three days. He didn't have to stay on doing that seven days. He didn't have to be commanding and commanding. He had authority and power. When authority is there, when power is there, we'll not have to go through any kind of gymnastics before we can cast out that evil. He cast out the devil and he cured that child from that very hour. Then came in verse 19, the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. In this case, it was not because of their sin. They had not developed their faith. They had unbelief in this area. They had reservations in this area. The authority God had given them, Christ had given them, they had not used it effectively. And so he said, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, faith is very important. If we fast and there is no faith, there will be no answer. If we pray and there is no faith, there will be no answer. The problem is unbelief. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you on the basis of faith. If you have faith, how be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Can I remind you again that you shouldn't just speak out that verse in isolation. Don't say, evil spirit will not go out of the believer without praying and fasting. This is not a believer. It's just somebody coming from outside. And the father was not a believer either, was not born again. He is not saying that this kind of evil spirit will not go out of the believer except by praying and fasting. He is saying the believer will not be able to deliver. Those who are outside the kingdom, the sinners who have demonic problems, you will not be able to deliver them except there is prayer and fasting. And it's not even saying that the person has evil spirit now. If you pray and fast now, that fellow will be delivered. He's saying that you should have had prayer and fasting. Develop your faith. Develop that authority. So that when you come across anyone outside, maybe in your office, maybe in your community, anywhere where you are, you find that evil spirit is troubling anyone, you'll be able to pray with authority and power, and those people are going to be delivered, and those evil spirits will get out of them. If we are children of God, we have authority over those demons. I said we have authority over those demons. And uh, whether you are fasting today or not, if you have fasted before, it's not every day of our lives we fast. If you have fasted already, and you have developed your faith, and you have looked at the word of God, the authority you possess already, you'll be able to deliver those people in trouble in Jesus' name. But how is it that some people pray and fast and fast and pray and pray and fast and keep on fasting and praying and nothing gets done? That leads us to point number two. Unfruitful periods of fasting. Unfruitful periods of fasting. There are times that people feel that the only thing they are going to do is pray and fast. 
And when they pray and fast, and the answer does not come, they begin to worry. They begin to question. And they begin to uh, pose the questions, why is it we have done everything we know how to do, and yet the answer has not come? I told you already in point one. That those people that prayed and fasted in Bible days, we find that they got rich of sin. They were righteous, they were holy. And because of that background of holiness and righteousness, the Lord answered them. If we remain in sin and we are praying and fasting, it will be unfruitful. Look at Isaiah chapter 58 from verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. My people, but they have transgression. My people, but they are not totally free from sin. My people, churchgoers. My people, religious people. My people, Israelites. Show them their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet, they seek me daily, and they like to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness, that forsook not the ordinances of their God, they ask of me ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted saving, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure. And exert all your labors, the pleasures of the world, worldliness in their lives, the pleasures and the lust of their eyes, the pleasure for the flesh. All those things were still there, they did not deal with sin. And you exert all your labors, you oppress people to do what you should have done, you over labor people. And those who work for you, you will not even pay them. You do not understand that other people are suffering. The word of God will say you are selfish. Because of that selfishness, fasting will be unprofitable, unfruitful. Then in verse 4, behold, ye fast for strive and, uh, de and debate to smite with the feast of wickedness. Ye shall not fast, as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. He said, if you are wicked, if you are violent, if you are oppressing other people, you cannot fast in that way and make your voice to be heard on high. That heaven will not hear. Zechariah chapter 7. In Zechariah chapter 7, the Lord was still talking to people about the unfruitful periods of their fasting. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land, and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even unto me? These people continued fasting every year for seventy years. And they fasted the fifth month, and they fasted the seventh month, and they were regular about it. And yet, do you see here, the Lord was saying, All those seventy years who were fasting, did you fast unto me at all? Did I recognize that you were even fasting? In verse uh, 6, When ye did it, and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Well, you broke the fast. And then you went into feasting. And you ate like I may not get food tomorrow. You ate like gluttons. Did you eat to my glory? Did you do everything to my glory? He said during the fast, was it to my glory? After the fast, was it to my glory? Was it not gluttony after gluttony? Pleasure of the flesh and demand of the flesh after pleasure of the flesh. Ye, should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? When Jerusalem was inhabited, 
and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her with men inhabited were uh, inhabited the south and the plain. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of all saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. He said, What I'm expecting from you. If the praying and fasting is going to be of any value, let there be righteousness. Let there be justice. Let there be equity. Let there be mercy and compassion. And oppress not the widow and the fatherless, nor the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. He said their hearts were full of all imaginations of evil. And yet they were praying and fasting. And nobody told them for 70 years that with evil imagination in their hearts, with all the iniquity, with injustice, with oppression of the poor, with oppression of the widow, that the praying and the fasting will be unnoticed by God. Nobody told them, or perhaps they told them they will not answer. Because in verse 12, in verse 11 we are told, but they refused to hack him. They pulled away the shoulder and they stopped their ears that they should not hear. They shrugged their shoulders. The obedience was not the important thing with them. Righteousness was not the important thing with them. In fact, stubbornness and stiff neck was the order of the day with them. And yet they were fasting and they were praying. Verse 12, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the Lord. And the words which the Lord of hosts has said, in his spirit by the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. It says that although they were fasting, although they were praying, yet he didn't answer them. Why? Because iniquity was there and they did not deal with that iniquity. Look at Second Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12. Reading from verse 15. And Nathan departed unto, unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. And it was very sick. Now the problem here was in the family of David. What happened is that David, instead of going to battle, was staying back at home. And the others went to battle. And eventually, while he was um, walking about, roaming about, uh, relaxing, he saw a woman um, in a bad condition. That is, he saw the, he saw the nakedness of the woman. And then instead of, re, instead of resisting temptation, he said, send for that woman. And then he committed immorality with that woman. And that woman sent eventually and said, it appears that uh, that sin has resulted into pregnancy. And so David uh, felt what to do was to send for the husband from the uh, war front. And he said for the husband Urias, and said, well, go home and uh, be with your wife and relax. Wanting to cover up his sin so that uh, it will be that the pregnancy is not for David. The pregnancy would appear to be for the husband. But the husband was concerned for the nation. And the husband said, how can the ark of the Lord stay over there on the war front in the battlefield and I will go to my house, therefore I will not go to my house. And then when David learned that this man will not go home so that he could cover up his sin, he made him drunk. He gave him wine. Even though the man had taken the wine, he still will not go. He said, well, I must cover up this sin by all means. He wrote a letter to Job. He said, when this man gets to you, make sure you put him in the hottest part of the battle. Let him die. And eventually the plan was carried out. The man died. After the man had died, now the, uh, David, instead of repenting, took that woman and made her wife. Obviously, you know God will not be happy with that. It's for pure eyes and to behold iniquity. With all that sin there, Nathan eventually came to him and pointed out the sin. Then he said, all right, I've forgiven you. But the child became sick. 
And the Bible says here, it was the Lord that struck the child that the child was seed. What did David do? In verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted, and he went in, and he lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him, and to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat uh, bread with them. And it came to pass that on the seventh day the child died. You see, we need to examine our lives. If there is sin in our lives, we must deal with the sin. Instead of just saying, well, I will fast, I will pray. If I fast and I don't deal without food, that's not going to interest God at all. What God wants is that you do without sin before you do without food. If you are going to fast, and the fast is going to be very effective in the sight of the Lord, you will make sure there is repentance in your life, there is righteousness in your life. In fact, if there is righteousness, if there is holiness, you will not have to fast for a long time. The Lord definitely will answer your prayer. Now, after you have dealt with sin, after you have made sure there is holiness in your life, what is it that the Lord is really looking for? That leads us to point number three, unlimited power of faith. Unlimited power of faith. Please always remember, never, never forget that fasting without faith will not do much. Praying without faith will not do much. In fact, faith without fasting will do much, much, much more than fasting without faith. Faith without fasting will do much, much, much more than fasting without faith. You see, what's important is our faith in the Lord. And if you are going to have faith in the Lord, read the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that develops your faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. If you are praying, but it's without faith, it will not please the Lord. If you are fasting, but there is no faith, it will not please the Lord. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. And that is the reward of them that diligently seek Him. If you are seeking the Lord, if you are waiting upon the Lord, make sure there is faith. Because it is that faith that will make Him to answer your prayer. In James chapter 1 verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, or any other thing we may lack, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. If you are praying, please ask in faith. You are fasting, ask in faith, nothing wavering. You see, there are people that may uh, fast for a whole day, or two days, or even three days, and not look at the promises of God and not look at the Word of God, and not look at the foundation of our faith, and not look at the reason why God should answer. You must read those promises, because they come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let, that, let not that man think that he shall receive any sin of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But if you can believe God, many things, wonderful things, are going to happen in your life. I'm sure you want to believe God. Believe the promises of God, and all things are possible actually in your life. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Mark 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Why don't you spend time reading the promises of God, meditating upon the promises of God, 
proclaiming the promises of God, repeating the promises of God, reminding God of the promise He has given you. Because if you can just believe those wonderful promises, all things are possible to him that believeth. In Mark chapter 11 verse 22, Jesus answering said, Have faith in God. That's all you need. Have faith in God. There is no problem for the one that has faith in God. The problem may appear to be there in the family, in the community, in the church, or even in the nation. If you will have faith in God, that's what God is looking for. It's not looking for how many days you have fasted. Some people think, if I can do it for seven days, if I can do it for 21 days, if I can do it for 40 days. No, it is not the length of the fasting the Lord is looking for. It's looking for how strong is, is your faith. Being strong in faith is staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was giving glory to God that what He has promised is able also to perform. How strong are you in faith? The centurion said, speak the word only. My servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, be it unto you, as thou wilt. It is a faith that the Lord is looking for. Do you remember that woman that came to the Lord, Sarah, Phoenician woman, and then said, Even the dogs take of the cross falling from the master's table. The Lord said, Great is your faith, O woman. Be it unto you as thou wilt. And the daughter was healed that very hour. The Lord is looking for her faith. If you can have faith in God, that situation you are talking about, everything will change. In verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, say unto this mountain, if you fast for many weeks and many days and you never talk to the mountain, you never use the authority God has given you against the mountain, the mountain may remain there, but you say to the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Do you believe that? I said, Do you believe that? In John chapter 14 verse 12. John 14 verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than this shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Before, because you pray for seven, because you fast for seven days. I said, is it because you fast so many days? No, because I go to the Father. Already is at the Father's right hand and is making intercession for you. Know your right. Know your authority. Know the promises of God. Know what the Lord has given to you already. Understand, there are some things the believer should never tolerate in his life. Never tolerate sin in your life. Never tolerate demonic oppression in your life. Never tolerate activities of Satan in your family or around you. Never tolerate sickness in your body. Because the Lord has given you authority. If you will stand in that authority and you will not tolerate what you shouldn't tolerate, then you will have victory in Jesus' name. Before we pray, I want you to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If your name is written in heaven, you have victory already. I said you have victory already. Do not tolerate anything coming from the devil. If you will not tolerate that thing, the Lord is going to give you complete, perfect, absolute victory. Because in Romans chapter 16 verse 20, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under where? Under your feet 
shortly. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. What's the latter part of that sentence? And that wicked one, that wicked one, that wicked one, toucheth him not. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and he loved not their lives even unto death. Stand in your authority. The devil, the demons, evil powers, sickness, they do not have any authority in your life. Claim your right, it will be yours in Jesus' name. Rise up and let's talk to the Lord. Don't think you have to wait until you pass for so many days before you can have what the Lord has provided for you. You have the victory already. And our praise should not be limited to ourselves. Our praise should go beyond ourselves. And our praise should give us authority to be able to pray for other people. In Jesus' name we pray. How many of you really believe, absolutely you believe, that victory can be yours in every realm, in every area, according to the word of God from this very moment. You believe that God cannot fail. You believe that He has given you authority. Do you really believe that Satan has no business in your family? That demons have no right on your children? That do you really believe that all those witches and wizards, they are powerless when it comes to the child of God? You should never be angry against God. You should never be angry against your fellow brother and sister. If there is anything to be angry against, you should be angry against the devil. Because he comes to trespass. He doesn't have any right to be in your family. He doesn't have any right to be in your business. If you are washed by the blood of the Lamb, never, be, never sit down crying and mourning. The devil is troubling me. You trouble the devil. You trouble the demons. You trouble all those evil powers. They don't have any right to be in your community, in your family. You have the victory already. You have the victory this morning. I said you have the victory this morning. If you really believe, you are not going to be crying because of the devil. You will tread on serpents and scorpions. You will tread over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You will not be running helter-skelter. You will not be running to the bush. You will not be running to the seaside. You will not be running to the mountain. You will not be running to a new ministry. You will not be running to the deceivers. You will stand on the right of a child of God. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe you are claiming the victory, I want you to be on your feet and I want your hands up. You are not begging for victory, you are claiming your victory. You are not doubting whether you are going to have it or not, it is yours already. Whatever you say, you speak to that mountain. By this afternoon that mountain should not remain there. That mountain should not remain there. It must not remain there. We, the people that believe in holiness, should enjoy the riches of heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. We come in that name that's above every name. The name that has authority. The name that commands power. The name that controls the universe. The name that controls the devil. We come in the authority that you have given us. I bring all my brothers before you. I bring all my sisters before you. 
I'm praying, O oh Lord, the victory that they have missed for so many years, for so many months, thinking they have to do this and do that before they get it. If they are born again, since they are your children, I pray, O oh Lord, give them the victory in Jesus' name. All that deception of the devil, I pray you remove it away from their minds in Jesus' name. The devil has no right in their family. Demons have no right in their family. I pray, O oh Lord, you make them to be completely free in Jesus' name. Every yoke, break it now. Every oppression, remove it now. Every affliction, remove it now. I place the mark of the blood of the Lamb upon every brother, upon every sister. And I pray that when those angels of death, angels of accident, all those demonic spirits of evil, when they come across them, they see the mark of the blood, they will pass over them in Jesus' name. All those people who have been living from hand to mouth, who do not have anything, all those people that are poor, in a miraculous way, provide for them in Jesus' name. All those who have been afraid of the wind, afraid of nothing, afraid of powerless people, afraid of people that are only bragging, afraid of the defeated devil. I pray you give them boldness now in Jesus' name. Every mountain in their lives, every mountain in their families, every impossibility around them, I cancel that thing, set them free in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, you'll give them the victory. You will give them authority that from now on, when they see anything that ought not to be there, anything coming from the paths of darkness, they will stand in their authority and they will drive that thing away in Jesus' name. Above all, make them righteous. Make them holy. And let the power, the authority that belongs to holiness people be in their lives in Jesus' name. Fulfill the number of their days. Protect them in the day and in the night. Every time be around them. The moment they open their mouth to ask you anything, honor your word and say their prayers in Jesus' name. Let their joy in no low limit. Fulfill their joy. Let there be happiness in their families. Lord, I pray that the devil that by fooling around them will not be able to fool around in Jesus' name. Do something spectacular. Do something supernatural. Do a particular miracle. They will know that this is a miracle in Jesus' name. Let your mighty hand be upon them. Let your hand be against their enemies. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.